So let us clap our hands for each other. And I thank you very much. I think this is it. On behalf of the Women's Federation for World Peace, the United Nations Correspondents Association in Vienna, and the European Network of Filipino Diaspora in Austria, it is a great honor. It's a privilege for me to welcome you all to this momentous event. As most of you probably know, today is the founding anniversary of the United Nations. 79 years that it has been existence, and it was, it's one of the biggest platform where global issues are addressed and hopefully solved, including the role of youth and the role of civil society in peace building in ushering in a peaceful society. So today we will have with us some speakers, some presenters that will dwell on this topic from the point of view of the youth and from the point of view of civil society. I don't want you to just sit and listen, but I would like to encourage you to sit, listen, and engage. I know that I'm not just speaking for myself when I say that peace is something that we all want. Peace is something that we are striving for. And I bet that each, if each, each and every one on our own does something that leads to peace, hopefully within our lifetime, we shall have peace. So on this note, I would like to call all the presenters and speakers basically on stage so that you can see their beautiful faces, so that they can be inspired by looking at you. Come. You're so quiet, it's almost scary. <laughs> Is it nice outside? Maganda ba sa labas? Okay. Let me just wait a bit that we put up our presentation. In the meantime, I would like to tell you about our very first speaker. Like I mentioned, it is because of her organization that we are here today. We are able to use this beautiful conference room to talk to each other, to engage, and think about what we can do to usher in peace as part of the youth, as part of civil society. So I hope I get this right. The lady on my left is Mariana Gomez. She's currently a consultant with UNODC's NGO unit, and she has been a tireless advocate for civil society and engagement in combating transnational organized crime. Mariana's work bridges the gap between grassroots organizations and international policy, ensuring that the voices of communities are heard in efforts to promote security and peace. So we look, we look forward to hearing her presentation. And if it's ready, Lily, we start now with, not with, your not with mine, but with Marianne. OK, thank you very much. So we give the floor to Marianne. Um, thank you very much, uh, Maricel, for your introduction, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the Women's Federation uh, and Renate in special that's been so active in uh, having us here and uh, for us to be part of this scenario. Um, so good afternoon. Welcome to the Vienna International Center for all of those that uh, is your first visit here. Um, I'm very honored uh, to be sharing this space with you and also to be sharing this, this panel with, with all of you. Um, thank you again for the Women's Federation for this invitation and uh, for giving us the space to share a bit of our work, especially on the 79th anniversary of the United Nations. We don't take that for granted. Um, and as you, as you will see today, and as I'm pretty sure Maricel is going to present later, we count today not only with the presence of international organizations, uh, but also of state representatives through the mission of the Philippines, uh, with local government through the um, Vienna City Council, civil society and activists. And I reflect this mostly because it is an opportunity to gather very different perspectives with a shared goal. Um, and I think these spaces are precisely meant for that. So you have very different levels of uh, policy and engagement, uh, putting in one same scenario, and I think those are precisely the type of scenarios we need to promote. Um, I'm going to try to stick with time, but please do watch me if I am speaking too much, which sometimes I do. 
Um, so I want to explain today a little bit what my organization does uh, and uh, our work in building peaceful societies through our mandate, emphasizing on the role of youth and civil society. Um, first of all, quick question and raise some hands. Um, how many of you are familiar with the UNODC? Okay, just to, okay. so I'll start also with that. Um, so the UN, the United Nations, as you know, it's a very big house with a lot of rooms. And one of those rooms is precisely called the UNODC, the United Nations Office and Drugs and Crime. Um, we are precisely a big house following common principles and the same goal. And you know this is mandate. Can you please go to the next slide? We are a office under what is called the UN Secretariat. Um, and our specific mandate is on fighting transnational organized crime, uh, the drug problem, corruption, and preventing terrorism through a specifically, um, oh, I actually have a clicker. Yes. What am I doing? <laughs> yes. Um, precisely on um, technical assistance, criminal justice aspects, um, and the providing precisely cooperation within, within countries. Mm, when I talk about these issues on organized crime, how many of you think that this is an effort for peace? Is there something that you easily bridge together, organized crime preventing organized crime and peace? The reason why I'm asking is because sometimes precisely when we talk about security, we don't necessarily talk about peace, or we don't, we don't think about peace. And as you can see precisely on the top, on our actual mandate is to contribute to global peace, security, human rights, and development, but making um, the world safer from drugs, crime, corruption, and terrorism. Um, we precisely often see security as a very traditional issue, apart from global affairs, when it is in fact also a development is issue and a peace building uh, effort. This is one of the messages that I want to come across today, uh, precisely in this uh, scenario of, of uh, the UN in general. You know this is work uh, in combating all of these this crimes is precisely also an effort for peace and it's an effort for development. We do this through three aspects, three functions, uh, normative, so precisely the ratification and implementation of treaties uh, and supporting domestic legislation. We do all of research and analytical work, basically providing the evidence base for policy. And we support the capacities of member states uh, to counter illicit drugs, crimes and terrorism. We work on five specific areas, as you can see in the little circles. Um, and one of the important things that I want to share today is the cross-cutting areas of our work. So precisely, it comes to gender equality and women's empowerment, human rights, and youth empowerment and child protection. These are precisely our cross-cutting commitments that UNODC has included in all of the programmatic efforts. Um, and it is important precisely because this is a whole of society approach. I don't want to bore you with all of these dates and probably conventions that you know, we don't need to go through, but this is just to give you an example of how decade after decade, uh, we've been seeing increasing concerns, global concerns about criminality and about how this is hindering our possibilities for peace and for development. So this is just the legal framework that shows you from 1961 with the first convention on drugs, how we've been increasing every year precisely on how to tackle these problems. Um, so I just wanted precisely to show how our mandate has expanded uh, precisely for the past um, 60 years since the first convention um, on tackling organized crime. Organized crime breaks communities' social tissue, it spreads fears, weakens institutions, and affects local, local and national economy. Above all, it also physically and mentally harms people. Um, so this is precisely just to show the development of this, of this situation. Um, I know that I've been talking a lot about policy and about what governments are doing. Um, and part of our mandate is precisely providing states and policymakers with the tools to build effective policies. But this cannot be done without a whole of society approach. Um, the work that we do involves a lot civil society and also involves youth. If we disconnect from these issues, we lose our focus of our work. 
Um, and this is also why I'm very happy to be able to translate this today into a scenario that is not technical and that it's not full of government representatives, because it's precisely through you and it's precisely through communities that we understand the goal of what we're doing and we don't lose the focus of our like office-based job, basically. Um, so this is about people. Um, this is why working with non-governmental actors and youth becomes essential to build successful responses and initiatives. And I wanted just to show you precisely some of the reasons why we work with civil society. We call it non-governmental actors because we cover, we cover NGOs, academia, and private sector. So not only the, the civil society part of it. Um, and we know precisely that through the expertise, the information, and the access and connection that civil society has to communities, um, we have a very strong entry point for governments to fight against organized crime and to protect people. And likewise, youth as both victims, sometimes unfortunately perpetrators, and at-risk groups, they need to participate in these decision-making processes and policies to tackle structural issues. If we do not know precisely what their problems are, we are not able to solve them. Coming a little bit with youth, and I started precisely explaining that the UN is a big house, uh, and the UNODC is one of the rooms. In 2018, the first um, youth strategy was approved and started being implemented by the United Nations. So this is across all of the different agencies that the United Nations has. And in 2021, when the new strategy for UNODC was written, this was included and incorporated into our work. What this means is that the emphasis of participation for youth is being heard and taken seriously to be incorporated in all of our programmatic efforts and activities. In practice, what this means is that whenever we are engaging in a new project, engaging with a new government, implementing a new policy, we need to bear in mind youth and we need to follow any specific guidance for that, as well as other, all of the other UN agencies. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you a lot with all of this information. I only want to show you all of the areas and youth activities that only UNODC is taking to support and protect youth. Um, as I explained before, we have five thematic areas. So those are the blue ones on top, the world drug problem, organized crime, corruption, terrorism, criminal justice. And through all of these, those are the activities and programs that we currently have to support youth. And this is only one organization among the, I don't know the specific number, I think around 40, that the UN has. So the work that it's out there precisely, it, it's a lot. I know we often see that it's not enough, but the work is out there. From there, from this and from protecting youth, I just wanted to come across with, or like to communicate a little bit, um, the projects that we have on the substance use prevention and health promotion, uh, precisely being done through schools and communities from the youth side, uh, countering corruption uh, by the role of education and the youth empowerment, um, acknowledging the contribution of sports as a tool for peace. So we also work a lot precisely on sports and culture and arts as uh, ways of preventing organized crime. Uh, and also um, communicating the risks posed by drugs, violence, and crime, especially on marginalized and at-risk youth. On the other side, when it comes to civil society, and I started saying that I wanted to today just highlight these two issues since it's precisely the topic of our, our, of our discussion, uh, my specific unit is called the civil society unit. And uh, among UNODC, or like in UNODC, our objective is precisely to bridge non-governmental organizations into the work that we do, the UNODC and member states. We know that sometimes it's very technical. Uh, it involves a lot of legal frameworks, a lot of treaties that nobody can remember. So our work is precisely through all of the work that civil society is doing with communities to engage them, increase their participation, um, letting them access precisely this type of spaces and make it a, uh, an increase in visibility for states. As I mentioned at the beginning, the work of civil society is very broad and is doing a lot, and it can be an entry point for governments to support those communities. These are some of the examples that we have done so far, and I think this is my last slide to like, give also like, space for the next speakers. 
uh, of some of the things that we have do done. We connect precisely like-minded actors. We bring different civil society organizations working in human trafficking, smuggling of migrants, uh, the gangs issue, use of drugs, firearms, you name it, into precisely discussing and centralizing their contributions. Um, we are making civil society accessible for governments, training them also in the UN language and how to access multilateral environments, and we're centralizing their efforts and expertise. Um, from all of the things that I'm saying and trying not to go into a very technical area, um, the message that I want to share across today is precisely that we often see security as a traditional topic and we see organized crime or something that doesn't affect us, but in fact this is a development issue too and it's a peace building effort too. The mandate of UNODC, the organization I work for, it, uh, goes hand in hand with global peace uh, development and human rights. Within this, youth components are cross-cutting and needs to be incorporated in all of the activities that we do, not only for the organization I work for, but for the UN in general. Uh, unfortunately, it has been incorporated into our, into our job. Um, the emphasis for participation of youth is being heard and taken seriously uh, to incorporate in all of our programmatic activities. The third message is civil society precisely has a lot of expertise and their connection to communities is essential for governments and we need to raise that voice. Youth as both victims and at risk group, if we don't protect and guide younger generations, our possibilities for peaceful societies will not be sustainable at all in the future. So if we do not protect precisely communities and young, younger generations now, what we are trying to build is not going to, to be sustainable. I'm going to just finish by saying that we live in a world where we constantly see conflict and we constantly see chaos, but in days like today, it, it reminds us of everything that's being done to counter and solve those issues, and it is within each one of us to have daily actions towards peace and stability. Um, we are reminded very often of all of the problems that we have outside, but sometimes we also need to be reminded of what we are doing and how we can support that. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I hope I didn't go too far, but uh, it's a pleasure again to be with you. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation and looking forward for the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much, Mariana. Mariana Gomez from UNODC. Listening to the presentation, which is indeed very informative, this is also an, a presentation that gives us hope. Uh, I hope you can all have a takeaway that indeed it is within us to do something towards uh, peace and stability. So there will be Q&A after, so hold your horses. You will have time, and I hope you'll take the opportunity later. That's why the presenters and uh, the ones will be delivering messages have actually been given very, very short time to give you, the attendees, time to ask questions, to make suggestions, so this will be a really productive event. So on that note, I would like to ask uh, our main speaker actually for today is somebody who came all the way from New York, but she's still sitting among the audience and I think she deserves this seat more than I do. So Merle, if you could take this seat and I move on to that podium over there, come. At least I get to use the presentation I did 30 minutes ago. <laughs> so if there are mistakes at this stage, I already want to apologize. Um, we've been basically promoting this event because we want people to come, and we've been very lucky you're all here. We're almost like the number we really imagined. So um, we have very, very good presenters, and uh, actually two main presenters, three and then others that will be giving inspirational remarks. So I've asked the help of Shirley to distribute for your information some, some notes about the speakers that we have today. And so basically, the first one who did it, beautifully projected on screen, is Mariana Gomez. If I made a typo in the name, in the table card, forgive me. As I said, this was 30 minutes ago. I know, I'm giving her a new name. From now on, you're Marian, the advocate for peace and stability security. Uh, another one that we have who will be talking with us, who will be delivering a message 
from our uh, Embassy of the Philippines in Austria is this one. Again, just to s briefly show you who we'll have with us. Of course, our very esteemed uh, colleague from the European Police Association, so take note, we're very safe here today. Uh, and he's also the Secretary General of the United Nations Correspondents Association in Vienna, UNCAV. I'm projecting this now because when speakers have their uh, presentations, we will not have the te technical capability to swatch through. The most beautiful presenter, as you can tell, this is my daughter. That's why I managed to force her, to bribe her, and to beg her to come and give a point of view of a youth when it comes to peace building. Thank you, sweetheart. You will get your 100 euro afterwards. <laughs> and give me back 200, okay? And we have somebody from the city of Vienna. I am so excited to listen to what she has to tell us because this represents the government of the country that the Filipinos love, Austria, okay? And uh, I don't know if he's here today, Marcus, because this is, Marcus, are you here? Are you, if you're not here, raise your hand. Oh, you cannot, okay? He's supposed to come, if not online, okay? And of course, somebody from New York coming all the way, arriving yesterday, will also be delivering some, some very beautiful presentation. And this is one of the women behind the Women's Federation for World Peace. Do I have anything else? Of course, we will be given a musical rendition by a very, very amazing singer who sings in, surely, how many languages? Five only, okay? <laughs> only five languages that she can sing in. And, well, these are just the UN development goals. So on this note, I would like now to move on and call, she's already at the podium, but to take on the mic. She's actually a lawyer by profession. She's representing the Embassy of the Philippines here in Austria with concurrent jurisdictions in Croatia, Slovenia, and the Slovak Republic. The great thing about being part of the Filipino community here in Austria is that we know that our embassy has our back covered. Every event that we organize, it gives me goosebumps. Uh, every event that we organize, whether it's cultural, something so serious as today that you're all not even smiling, uh, something, ball, whatever, we are always supported by our embassy. So she is the attache of the Philippine Embassy and the, our permanent mission. And today she brings a wealth of experience from the dipl her diplomatic career. With a focus on UNODC and UNCITRAL, her expertise spans political and economic relations. Attorney Daryl Jennerin Migano will share her perspective on the significance of youth engagement in legal frameworks and policy advocacy as tools for peace building, and also on what the embassy, I guess, does when it comes to these issues. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give her a big round of applause, Attorney Daryl Jennerin Migano. Thank you so much, Ms. Maricel. Good afternoon, everyone. I extend my heartfelt thanks to WFWP and of course, and Feed Austria for this kind invitation uh, to this important event. And I want to thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to represent the Philippine Embassy and Permanent Mission. Um, it is truly an honor to be with you today as we commemorate the founding of the, Uni of the United Nations, an organization that has stood for peace, unity, and human dignity. The UN vision is a world where conflict is rare, justice prevails, and human rights are the bedrock of society. It is a vision that speaks not only to nations and governments, but also to teach, us, teach one of us especially our youth and civil society. The theme of this activity speaks to the heart of the UN's vision for the future. The energy, creativity, and commitment of young people around the world have proven time and again to be powerful catalysts for change. From advocating for human rights to leading movements for climate action and peace building, youth have a critical role in shaping the societies we aspire to create. Young people with their energy, creativity, and ability to think outside the box are the catalyst of tomorrow's solutions. 
They have shown their ability to lead social movements, advocate for human rights, and foster understanding across borders. In the Philippines, our constitution has enshrined the principle of the state recognizing the role of the youth in nation building and that it, it, it shall promote and protect their physical, moral, spiritual, intellectual, and social well-being. At the UN, there is a wealth of youth-relevant and youth-focused work happening as the UN has long recognized young people as a major human resource for development and key agents for social change, economic growth, and technological innovation. To have a meaningful engagement of the youth, it is important that they must be given the proper tools, such as information, education about, and access to their civil rights. Meanwhile, the role of civil society cannot be overemphasized, as it serves as the voice of the people, holding institutions accountable and ensuring that peace is not just the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice, equity, and opportunity for all. In fact, in the Philippines, the role of civil society is also enshrined in no less than the Constitution, as the participation of civil society in governmental processes is an essential and much desired component in empowering citizens by giving them opportunities to articulate their needs and to take part in the decision-making processes. An active civil society participation is vital in the pursuit of a more participatory and responsive governance. We are also honored to have with us today people who can share with us their experiences and insights on today's theme. And as we reflect on the founding principles of the United Nations, let us reaffirm our commitment to empowering young people and civil society. Together with their leadership and our support, we can usher in a future that is not only peaceful, but prosperous, fair, and sustainable for all. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. This is a very inspiring speech. By the way, again, I would like to reiterate that after the speeches, which is all can hear are very short, succinct, and you will have your microphones to use. And it's not just about questions, it's about opinions, suggestions, messages that you might have. Our event today, uh, is it live streamed or not? Are we live streaming? Ah, we are on Zoom. I don't know how many millions are joining. 15 million? <laughs> okay. So uh, it's, it's a platform that can be shared. So please, at the end of the, the presentations, really feel free to say something, share your thoughts with us. Okay, thank you. The next speaker we have with us is somebody who's a favorite in the Filipino community. Well, somebody reacted right away. That means, yes, he is. Uh, sometimes we joke that behind the exterior, inside, is a Filipino. He's, he's a supporter of everything that we do, everything that we undertake, and advocacies that we have. So it is a great pleasure to have him here with us. He's, he's representing two powerful organizations, one of the media and one of security, the police. So representing the United Nations Correspondents Association in Vienna, a.k.a. UNCAV, and the European Police Association, EPA, let us please welcome Mr. Hermann Kreuher. He wants to stand next to me. Just teasing Hermann, please. Thank you. Thank you, Maricel, for your warm welcome and the presentation. Um, my, I will talk about youth's role in peace building and conflict prevention. The topic of youth 
has not only recently become a topic of discussion in society as a whole. For centuries, young people have been the subject of and actors in the discourse, not least when it comes to change and transformation. It is often young people who set such processes in motion and keep them alive. Their energy, their drive, their pronounced sense of justice, the hope they place in the good, these all are qualities that characterize them even if they are not always visible. At the same time, there are also situations in which young people are not believed to have this strength and seriousness of purpose. Rather, the perception is characterized by contra contradiction. On the one hand, youth is associated with culture of fun, lack of responsibility and carefulness. On the other hand, responsibility, conformity and performance are demanded. This is reason enough to take a closer look at the role of young people, their participation in society building processes and the environments that favor this. Young people have a unique ability to mobilize communities and bring about positive change. They can use this ability to promote intercultural and interreligious dialogue and build bridges between different social groups. In this way, they can help to reduce tensions and prevent conflict. Peace building and conflict prevention are crucial elements for the growth and development of any society. These efforts have been primarily led by governments and civil society organizations for a long time, leaving out the crucial role that youth can play in these processes. However, youth have immense potential to contribute to peace building and conflict prevention efforts in various ways. Firstly, youth can contribute to peace building and actively participating in decision making. Youth are a significant segment of any society and their perspectives and voices must be heard in peace building and conflict prevention discussions. By involving youth in decision making processes, government and other stakeholders can leverage their energy and creatively in developing solutions and prevent conflicts. Secondly, youth can play a vital role in promoting social cohesion and tolerance. Youth have a unique ability to mobilize communities and create positive change. They can use this ability to promote, to promote intercultural and interfaith dialogue and build bridges between different social groups. By doing so, they can help to reduce tension and prevent conflict. Thirdly, youth can be instrumental in addressing the root causes of conflict such as poverty, unemployment and inequality. Youth unemployment and underemployment are significant problems in many societies and they can lead to frustration and feeling of hopelessness. These feelings can fuel tensions and conflicts. By providing opportunities for youth to participate in economic activities, governments and other stakeholders can address the root causes of conflict and promote peace. Despite the immense potential, youth face significant challenges in contributing to peace building and conflict prevention efforts. One of these primary challenges is a lack of opportunity for youth to participate in decision-making processes. Many governments and organizations do not take youth perspectives seriously and their voices are often ignored. Another challenge to this, lack is, to this lack of 
access to, uh, to resources and funding for youth-led initiatives. Many youth-led initiatives promoting peace and preventing conflicts often lack the resources to implement their programs effectively. This lack of funding can prevent youth from making mean, meaningful contributions to peace-building efforts. Lastly, youth also face a challenge of negative stereotypes and perceptions. Many people perceive youth as being apathetic, disinterested, or even violent. These stereotypes can prevent youth from being taken seriously in peace-building efforts and undermine their potential to contribute. In conclusion, youth have immense potential to contribute to peace-building peace and conflict prevention efforts. By involving youth in decision-making processes, promoting social cohesion and tolerance, and addressing the root causes of conflict, governments and other stakeholders can leverage the energy and creativity in youth in promoting peace. However, addressing in challenges faced by youth such as the lack of opportunities, resources and negative stereotypes is crucial to unlocking their full potential in peace building and conflict prevention. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Herman, Mr. Herman Kreuher. Um, in what you've covered, indeed, it sounded like there are so many problems. Um, but what kind of uh, struck me was the words you, you mentioned at the end of your message, that especially for the youth, you have the full potential when it comes to peace building um, and conflict resolution. So basically, I think it's like a mantra. Let's start with ourselves. And then let's group together. Uh, we have uh, something that we use in the Philippines to clean our houses. It's called walis. It's made of uh, single, I don't know how to describe, it's like small sticks, but very thin ones. If you use it only as one entity, it really does nothing. But grouped together, it has really the power to clean, uh, to make a difference. So let's, let's start from ourselves group together, like-minded people, like-minded like generations even, and do something for peace building and conflict resolution. So thank you, Herman. The next speaker we have is a presenter that's very familiar to her, uh, to me, to me, sorry. I know, I know her since she was in my stomach. Okay, so um, she's uh, what I call my clone, although she doesn't like the term. She's currently taking up uh, business and economics at the University of Vienna, and at the same time interested in fashion and communications. She's going to share with us uh, her point of view about the role of youth in a very general way in ushering peace in our society. At the same time, she's representing an organization that I hold dear in my heart. It's the European Network of Filipino Diaspora. And she will give, in a very short time that she has, a presentation also on what NFID Austria and NFID across Europe does for um, ushering in a peaceful society. Sara Giselle Rojas. Thank you, Mom. Um, I'm expecting the 200 euro in my bank account after this. Okay. <laughs> so good day, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow peace advocates. As we celebrate the founding of the United Nations, let's reflect on the vision for world peace, equality, and justice for all. So in my presentation, Young Voices, Big Impact, I will discuss the role of youth in shaping a peaceful society. Furthermore, I will highlight how the European Network of Filipino Diaspora serves as a platform for these vital efforts. So the United Nations was, as we know, founded in 1945 with one overarching goal, to promote international peace and security. 
At its core are human rights, sustainable development, and the rule of law. However, peace cannot be achieved by government and international bodies alone. It requires the active participation of every citizen, particularly the youth and civil society. So in its agenda for sustainable development, the UN has identified 17 sustainable development goals, also known as SDGs. Of these goals, goal 16, concerning peace, justice, and strong institutions, reminds us of the importance of promoting peaceful and inclusive societies. The youth, representing 16% of the global population, play a critical role in this process. So our collective action is really crucial. Now to the role of youth in building peace. So youth are often seen as leaders of tomorrow. In actuality, we're leaders of today. Our creativity, our passion, our drive for justice make us essential in making change. Young people worldwide are leading peace initiatives, engaging in conflict resolution, and advocating for policies that promote harmony and inclusion. So the youth contribute to peace in multiple ways. The first one is advocacy and awareness. Through social media platforms and grassroots mo movements, young people can quickly spread the message of peace and awareness. The second one is education and empowerment. Educating youth about peace, democracy, and civic is engagement is essential. When young people understand their rights and their responsibilities, they can play a more active role in community development and peace building. Last but not least is dialogue and mediation. In conflict affected areas, young leaders often act as mediators, promoting dialogue and reconciliation between groups. So youth must be equipped with the right tools and the right platforms to enact change. This is where ENFID comes in. The European Network of Filipino Diaspora, also known as ENFID, was founded in Rome in 2012 and currently has 17 affiliate countries in Europe. It's an organization that aims to connect and empower Filipino communities. And its vision is a thriving, empowered diaspora that contributes positively to society in Europe and maintains strong connections to the Philippines. So ENFID's mission is supported by four pillars that guide our activities and our projects. They're also known as the four E's. The first one is empowering European youth. The second is education and learning, embracing the environment, and last but not least, elevating arts, culture, and sports. So through its various programs and initiatives, ENFID promotes youth empowerment. We recognize that young Filipinos in Europe are uniquely positioned to make an impact, both in our home countries, but also in the Philippines. So by creating leadership programs, workshops, and community projects, ENFID helps equip the youth with knowledge and skills they need to advocate for peace. The second is cultural exchange and dialogue. Through participation with other or partnership with other diaspora groups and international organizations, ENFID encourages cultural dialogue, making and promoting mutual understanding and reducing barriers that could lead to conflict. The third is advocacy for migrant rights. ENFID advocates for the rights of Filipino migrants, supporting their integration in European societies while still preserving their cultural identity. So in doing so, it promotes social inclusion and reduces the potential for social tensions. So in conclusion, we must remember, peace is not a passive state, it's an active process that we have to nurture. The youth and civil society are key drivers in this process, and they ensure that future generations inherit a world that's crowded in justice, peace, and equality. So organizations like ENFID are essential for enhancing these efforts to support the UN's vision of a peaceful society. And um, due to time constraint, I can't really delve into um, all of the details and activities geared towards youth, but if you still have questions, you can come to me after presentation or you can visit our website. Um, on that note, 
let us continue to work together across generations, across nations, to create a world where peace is not just a dream, but a shared reality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Sara Giselle Rojas. Uh, I'm pleasantly surprised at the presentation that you did. Okay, I give you 100 euro later. Uh, like she said, uh, questions are welcome later. Please approach her, especially the young people in this room and the young ones, okay? And I encourage those with organizations, with groups that are on the same wavelength to please share later. What do you have in your country? What do you have in your community that allows you, you know, to encourage, to usher in like a peaceful society? So thank you so much. Next we have, on the spotlight, a representative from our host country, the Republic of Austria. She's a member of the Vienna City Council and a scholar of integration and migration studies has a very deep understanding of intersection between migration and peace, and her leadership in promoting inclusive policies in Austria will provide us with valuable perspectives on the role of civil society in fostering peaceful and integrated communities. If she has more information in the sheets that you have. She has more information in, I again swallowed the clicker, Oh, you have it, okay. I thought I, I was the culprit. Uh, so, um, yes, so representing the, our host country, Austria, and giving us a message, a presentation today, let's all welcome Magister Karolin hunger Lender. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests. It's a great honor for me to provide a brief input on integration policies in Vienna. My name is Caroline Hungerländer. I'm the managing director of the Institute, um, as you can see, yes, for of the Institute for Environment, Peace and Development, and I'm a member of the Vienna City Council. So. My institute um, is a publicly funded independent think tank working along the lines of sustainable uh, development goals and contributing to the implementation in Austria. Now, let me first briefly talk about two main challenges for integration policy in Vienna and you will see that we have a very practical hands-on approach of um, analyzing challenges and addressing them and um, hopefully solving them. Vienna undoubtedly is a highly international city with extensive experience in intercultural coexistence. In this very tradition, we do approach new challenges with commitment and dedication. Since 2015, Austria has taken in many refugees, including a large number of young men. Young refugees are an important target group of Vienna's integration policy, and indeed this does confront us with challenges. Another challenge is the democratic um, representation of young people with a migration background. In the city of Vienna, more than one third of the voting age population is not eligible to vote because they don't have citizenship. How can we motivate young migrants to engage politically even without the right to vote? So you'll see I'm going to talk about education and I'm going to talk about empowerment. Yes, I did that. Okay. Um, let's see how we address the first challenge. I want to introduce to you a flagship project of the city government, namely the Vienna Youth College. This project targets young, predominantly male refugees. The Youth College is a training program which was invented actually last year that provides a comp comprehensive okay. educational pathway for asylum seekers, um, for, for refugees with asylum status. Um, and and um, for people with subsidiary protection. Yes, okay. Um, the program offers German language courses, 
basic education in mathematics, English and digital skills, along with workshops and practical training in various professions. Participants also receive support in finding jobs and apprenticeships. Furthermore, the college also provides information about leisure activities in Vienna, the structure of the labor market and democracy training. And of course, the program is free for participants. So what you see on this picture is um, two participants um, doing sports and they try to enhance concentration um, but while doing sports um, because they uh, figured out that um, many refugees are lacking um, concentration and they try to work on that by um, encouraging, encouraging them to um, be physically active. So the college operates five days a week with 30 hours of courses aimed at providing a stable daily structure, which is very important as we learned within time. Up to 5,000 young persons at the age of 15 to 25 um, years are being trained. 85 um, participants are men, mainly from Syria. And up until now, the program succeeded in helping about half of the participants in finding a job or further education. The other 50% remain at the youth college for further training. Now, after presenting this um, public funded project, I would like to introduce a civil society initiative as well. Integration in our city also happens through many private initiatives and it's truly the dedication of numerous individuals um, and NGOs who create opportunities for interaction and who contribute to peaceful coexistence. One of these initiatives is a training program which I happen to be the founder. It was five years ago my colleagues and I introduced a one-year training program for political participation aimed at the young Christian migrants or refugees living in Vienna. We were puzzled by the question how to help young migrants to engage politically. Our analysis showed that many first and even second generation migrants struggle with three points. First, they don't have helpful networks, neither in politics, nor in economy, nor in administration. Second, they lack what we call system knowledge. Third, the entry barrier to engage politically is very high indeed. To be honest, which young person knocks on a party's door and says, hello, I want to contribute? No one does this. Therefore, our training program aims to fill these gaps and is easily accessible. First, we reach out to the people. It is us knocking um, on their doors. It is us visiting communities in order to introduce the program. Second, our speakers become part of the participants' networks and they are available for questions and concerns and help even after the lectures. Third, we focus on system knowledge. How do things work in Austria on paper and in reality? For example, how does social partnership function? Who are the points of contact in ministries? But also, why does Austria take its historical responsibility in the fight against anti-Semitism so seriously? All this is conveyed in our, uh, to our participants in both in theory and in practice. Up until now, we trained more than 60 young migrants from 27 different countries, various denominations and educational backgrounds. And I can proudly say that some of them already successfully work in the field of politics, even without the right to vote. So you see that um, empowerment, even politically, is possible even when it's um, very difficult to gain a right to vote as it is in Austria. Now, let me finish my presentation at this point. I have, I have given you, I hope I have given you insights into exciting projects contributing to a peaceful and harmonious coexistence in Vienna. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Magister Hunger Lender, for that very informative presentation. For those who are really listening closely, think of the opportunities that are out there so that you can be engaged and you can take part with the opportunities that they have for everyone. So even if you don't acquire the, 
the right to vote, but to, you can be engaged in, in a way, in your own way, through the trainings and programs that they have, and really know uh, what's happening and being, in a way, part of the decision-making process in the country where we live right now. So thank you so much for that one. Please, you have um, all the time later to also approach her and uh, talk to her um, at the end of our presentations. Okay, so where are we now? We're at this point where we'll call on a guest speaker who came all the way from New York to be with us today. As she arrived yesterday, she's part of the big global network of the Women's Federation for World Peace. She's uh, the Vice President of Administration for Women's Federation for World Peace International and a global advocate for women, for peace, and the environment. She brings with her decades of experience in, in peace education and leadership, and she will offer her unique perspective on how civil society organizations can harness the power of youth leadership to advocate for peace and global scale. In fact, today is a very special day on the occasion of the 79th uh, founding anniversary of the UN because she's going to present something quite novel for us. So ladies and gentlemen, please give her a big round of applause, Miss Merle Christina Arlaan. Thank you. Thank you, Marizel. Distinguished leaders, youth leaders. Well, actually, you know what? Is it possible to play the video first? Yes, because our team of young people in New York, uh, they r stayed overnight to prepare that video just for everyone today. Across the world, communities are facing division and conflict but a new generation of young leaders are stepping forward to create change. By using the youth with tools and powers to lead, we are empowering them to become peace builders, bringing hope, reconciliation, and healing to their communities. Through hands-on learning, mentorship, and real-world problems, these young leaders are creating solutions that heal divisions and foster lasting peace. They're not just creating a safe place of dialogue, they're building the future, one act of peace at a time. Aligned with global goals for peace, sustainable development, and gender equality, these young chain makers are shaping a brighter, more harmonious world. But they can't do it alone. With your help, we can empower more young people to become the leaders their community needs. Together, we can build a community of peace, unity, and hope. Empower the next generation, heal the world. This United Nation aims to empower young leaders, and we are thrilled to share some of the key takeaways of this year's Summit of the Future participants. I would say that my key like um, takeaway that I I would have for the Summit of the Future is a collaboration because with the collaboration we can just uplift the countries that they have like somehow they are left behind and we can make a sustainable future for them also. Mia Vaccarella and I am an intern at the Women's Federation for World Peace International. I had the privilege of attending the Summit of the Future Action Days in September, and what struck me the most about this was the power of youth involvement in shaping policies. Whether it's tackling climate change or addressing gender inequalities or structural inequalities, youth deserve a say in their future. Hi, my name is Van Guzman, and I was privileged enough to attend the UN Summit of the Future here in New York City with Women's Federation for World Peace International. As a youth itself, I was very interested to learn more about what they had to say about the youth involvement and how they aim to promote the involvement itself. And after hearing various conferences and speeches about this, I feel like this event has really done what it was meant to do, and that is to educate people on how to include the youth in all of these major decisions for the future. So my takeaways that I got from all of these presentations was that it's important to eliminate poverty by improving the healthcare and technology access putting the youth in the center of the development for peace and security, empowering the youth through science, tech, and innovation, and lastly but not least, to increase youth participation in politics, culture, and social se sectors. Hi, I'm Marcia, and some of my key takeaways from the UN Summit of the Future were that we have a lot of goals that we've set, and with the help of many 
people that had gathered from all around the world for this conference that lasted a few days. I think we had some very valuable and fruitful discussions that will definitely lead to some impactful change. Yeah, Ms. Bauer, thank you so much for your efforts here. A couple of years ago, we had a um, town hall meeting with the president of the General Assembly. And there was a young person, a youth leader, who traveled all the way from Africa. And he asked the president of General Assembly, Your Excellency, we really want to make our young voices be heard and be in the decision-making table so that we can impact and we can change the world. How do we do that? How can we be heard? Because the UN is seem to be an exclusive uh, intergovernmental body and space. And the president of General Assembly, he wisely answered saying, Young man, if you want to change the world, my advice to you is you go back to your country, in your communities, talk to your local council and your local stakeholders. Have a conversation and create an advocacy message that is of interest and share your vision to them. And for sure, they will support you. They will be inspired by you. And that is where we can start making transformation in this world. And that is where your voice can make the biggest impact in this world. And um, I was very happy because the city of Vienna is here. And also, the, um, um, in New York City, we have a project called the Young Global Peace Ambassador, and um, the New York City has uh, funded us, beginning, just the beginning funding, um, just to get our foot in the door, but to start a, a small uh, project together. That is a big door opener for the young people of the world. And in my background, I've spent 10 years in the Philippines working with the, the local council and uh, the, the education sector and all sectors of society. And that's where I see that if we want to make impact in the world, it starts right there in our local community. And then it can be a best practice that we can present as a model for the United Nations to look at. And so, yes, that's how I start my story. Um, so today, 
as we commemorate the UN dream, the founding anniversary of the UN, the 79th birthday of the UN, my message, my topic is on the UN dream, peace building through forgiveness, reconciliation, and healing. It could not be more timelier and more relevant. As we gather to mark the 79th anniversary of the United Nations, we must confront a sobering reality despite the UN's decade-long efforts to achieve peace and development. Divisions are deepening, conflicts persist, and the social problems facing our young people are only worsening. There are over 110 active conflicts continue to ravage communities worldwide, affecting millions of lives. Social polarization, environmental degradation, and growing inequality are fracturing the fabric of our societies. Despite our global aspirations for peace and development, the world is ever more divided. The Global Peace Index reports a steady decline in global peace over the past decade, with the world experiencing more conflicts today than at any time in the past 30 years. On a community level, we see rising polarization, social unrest, and heightened divisions within societies, um, and even including the, the young people, our young people, mental health issues, and all kinds of issues plaguing our young people and our families today. And, and they, these are affecting our young people and our communities. While the UN and its member states have made remarkable strides, we must ask ourselves, why is peace still so elusive? Why are our young people, who would be the hope of the future, increasingly facing violence, conflict, and social disintegration? These questions highlight the urgent need for a new approach, one that addresses the roots of conflict and prioritizes reconciliation, healing, and forgiveness. This is where our work begins. Today, I am honored to introduce the Young Global Women Peace Ambassadors Leadership Program, a bold initiative that seeks to empower young women and girls to be peace builders, reconcilers, and leaders in their communities. The program is built on the belief that forgiveness, empathy, and healing are the foundational elements of sustainable peace. It represents a bold commitment to addressing the root causes of conflict and division. We need a new path, one grounded in forgiveness, healing, and reconciliation, not just between individuals and communities, but also between humanity and planet, our planet that we call home. I would like to, uh, reiterate and, and go into more detail about the nature of this project. It's almost like a revolutionary idea, although peace and reconciliation has always been there. But um, even in, in Women's Federation, we have not, aside from the uh, Bridge of Peace ceremonies, uh, we have not really engaged the young people in fully understanding the vision the noble vision of the UN, which is peace and development, one world of a unified families of nations. However, the way our young people are watching the news and watching the world leaders deal with conflicts are, are sad to say, far from ideal. So here is our small baby step attempt to encourage our young people um, and leading the, the way for them to establish a world of peace. So in order for them to become a, a, a young global peace ambassador, they, in their little community, we will ha have a six month of education program, it is hybrid, and in order for them to get the certificate to be an ambassador, um, they have to find 12 uh, pairs of conflicted, conflicting individuals, whether it's their neighbors, conflicting neighbors, 
fighting neighbors or bullying or gangs in, in the classrooms or in, in their schools and in their communities. Or it can be cultural. It can be their father and mother. It can be their relatives. We make it very simple and doable, but ingraining in them that the way to establish a world of peace is going, thinking of a, a collective vision that war is not an option, that it is not part of the blueprint of humanity. It is a world where we are one global family and the only option to solving our current problem is when we describe and work together for a world that is beautiful, that is of unity, that is of beautiful memories uh, with empathy and love. And unless we describe it to our young people, unless we create platforms and projects for them to experience it, then, then they are going to go into 30, 12, 50 years ahead not knowing what it is like. So this little project of us, we want this to be um, implemented in the communities. And then we call them Young Global Peace Ambassadors. And at, right now, we are reaching out to ages 16 to 24-year-olds. But once we implement this and we have our cities funding these projects, we are going to um, um, make young global, little global peace ambassador as early as first grade. You know, this is a way of educating them. Imagine a world, every community where our young people are intentionally, intentionally creating a world of peace. And they can put their mark. They, they will say that they have contributed to building a world of peace. So the young global peace ambassadors in a world where young women and girls are often marginalized, their voices stifled, this project offers them a platform to not only speak, but to lead. It is a transformative program designed to provide participants with leadership training, peace building skills, and the confidence to create real change in their communities. These young women will be at the forefront of efforts to heal divides, foster reconciliation, and build bridges where there were once barriers. The Young Global Women Peace Ambassadors aims to equip young women and girls with a holistic and revolutionary peace paradigm, leadership skills, and confidence needed to drive positive change to help the UN achieve its founding vision. They will engage in leadership training, track to diplomacy, and community development projects designed to bridge divides, heal past conflicts, and build sustainable peace. As they lead, these women will create safe and peaceful communities where forgiveness replaces resentment and unity replaces division. But peace building is not just about mending relationships between people. It is also about healing our relationship with the planet. Climate change is not only an environmental issue, it is a peace and security issue. The degradation of our ecosystem is fueling conflicts over resources, displacement, and injustice. In this regard, our Young Global Women Peace Ambassador also embraces environmental advocacy. They were they will be taught how to grow their own food and be taught how to go back to the basics of understanding the relationship with nature and how to manage nature. This is why emphasizing projects such as community peace gardens and sustainability initiatives where young women can engage in environmental restoration efforts while simultaneously fostering peace and cooperation in the words of our funder, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, she said that peace starts with me. If we want to see a peaceful world, we must first heal our own hearts, heal our relationships, and heal the planet. Let us also reflect on the Beijing Platform for Action because next year is the 30 years anniversary of the Fourth World Conference on Women in Beijing. 
it, and and there, there they address the 12 critical areas of concern to up, to uplift and empower women and girls but in the women's federation and particularly in this young global women peace ambassador we are addressing five of the 12 critical areas of concern and these are the women and the environment through climate action, SDG 13, women in decision making, uh, SDG 5, gender equality, education and training for women and girls, um, SDG 4, quality education, women in conflict, SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and SD, uh, SDG uh, yeah, SDG 4, still education and training for women and girls. So these areas of concern are not just issues for women and girls, they are global issues that when addressed brings us closer to de delivering the promises of the Fourth World Conference on Women uh, and the Beijing Platform for Action. Allow me to share an example of how the Young Global Women Peace Ambassador is making an impact on the ground um, particularly in New York City, through it is a formative stage of partnership with New York City through our collaboration with the People's Money and Civic Engagement Commission. Uh, this is a project of a funding project of New York City to more than 30 uh, NGOs, uh, civil society organizations. Here, young women from diverse backgrounds will engage in participatory budgeting and civic projects, including the Bridge of Peace initiatives and the creation of com community peace gardens. And these efforts will not only transform public spaces, but also transform the hearts of those involved, and particularly the immigrants in New York City, promoting forgiveness, reconciliation, unity uh, among divided immigrant communities. The program is also being developed today, and we have here journalists from Iraq. I'm really proud to say that we have a fellow by the name of Bala Ali Mahmoud. She is a fellow of uh, IREX and um, Serving Women's Federation for four months. She is developing with us uh, this peace uh, education program and we are going to bring this launch this in Iraq in hopefully by early next year and India where thousands of young women will be trained as peace ambassadors leading efforts to heal post-conflict communities address educational disparities and promote environmental conservation each participant will contribute to a triple effect of peace healing, not only their local communities, but contributing to global harmony. So uh, looking ahead, the summit of the future, which is concluded uh, last month in September, it presents a unique opportunity to elevate the voices of the young women at the global level. So this summit, which will shape future of global governance, must include the perspectives of young women who are on the front lines of peace building. We must ensure that their, their experiences, their leadership, and their solutions are heard and integrated into global policies. In closing, let us remember the words of our founder, Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, the founder of WFWPI. She said that women are the harbingers of peace. When women stand together, guided by love and forgiveness, they hold the key to healing the wounds, the wounds of the world. Indeed, it is through the leadership of women, especially young women, and I'm looking at you, Sarah. Um, that we can realize the UN dream, one global family of unified nations. But I must say this, without letting go of our animosity and resentment, without forgiveness and healing, I don't believe humanity will ever see a world of peace. It is the time for us to confront the pain of the past, to forgive, to heal, and to build bridges for the future. I call upon all of you, UN agencies, ambassadors, civil society leaders, and youth advocates to rally behind this movement. Let us work together to empower young women and girls as peace builders who will reconcile communities, heal the planet, and forge a path to sustainable peace. Let us make forgiveness and healing a brand word 
associated with peace building. Let us make forgiveness and healing the cornerstone of our peace building efforts. Let us unite in supporting youth and empowering young women and girls to take the lead in healing the world. Let us give them the tools, the platform, and the fund and the fund, <laughs> and the opportunity to transform conflict into cooperation and division into unity. Together, we can build a future where peace is not just a distant ideal, but a lived reality for every person and every community around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much to our very passionate speaker. Uh, good luck with the programs that you have. And I think this is a challenge uh, to us. It's a call for action. And I think also especially for the men and boys. I feel you. It's all about women here and girls. But what stops you from creating a men's federation for world peace, right? Huh, Herman? Ah, but of course we have here the representative of Universal Peace Federation. Uh, Mr. Hyder, so please approach him and say, I want to be a peace advocate with your organization. 